series of uh, poems under the uh, guidance of a new uh, po uh, poet curate curator, and that will be uh, Tina Kelly, and she will in fact be reading the first poem. Um, Tina's, uh, Tina's poetry has appeared in Poetry Northwest, Harry Schooner, Find Madness, The Christian Science Monitor, and the Journal of the American Medical Association. She's a freelance journalist, uh, writing mostly for the New York Times and the Christian Science Monitor. She also has a weekly column, I found out, in the New York Times uh, called Get Out, about adventures within two hours of Seattle. Uh, and I take that back, it appears in Friday, uh, Seattle Times. One of her poems, Five Opsidalian's Miniatures, uh, has been nominated by uh, Beloit uh, Poetry Journal for a Pushcart Prize this year. And in 1997, the Bullis Kaiser uh, Prize from uh, Poetry North Northwest for seven poems published there in 1997. Anne was honored uh, to be included in last year's Seattle Poetry Festival and the Big Book at Bumbershoot in 1994. And for those of you out there uh, who have connections to the publishing world, she's currently uh, trying to find a publisher for her book-length manuscript of poetry entitled Self-Portrait as a Kite. And then, uh, therefore, I'd like to introduce uh, Tina Kelly, who will be uh, reciting her poem today, uh, Instructions from the Choir Director. Thanks, Nick. Thanks for the privilege of being curator here. I really appreciate the um, voice you're giving to poetry. Um, this is called Instructions from the Choir Director, and it has an epigraph from, um, it's a quote from composer and director Fred West, who runs City Cantabile Choir. And his quote is this, the voice isn't an instrument that has buttons or keys to press, but you can control it with images. If you raise your hand at the end of a note, that in itself keeps the note from going flat. And here's the poem. We start together by inhaling together, then picturing quickly how cherry trees hold their petals suspended above the ground. And we start together, aiming together, six ball in the corner pocket, using the cue of his agile downbeat. When we sing slowly, we are asked to think of the spread of mosses and liverworts over the rocks from lakes and streams, up the hills, on Dante across the continents. When we sing Sforzando, we imagine a sun so bright and sudden that it makes ours cast a shadow. We learn deep breaths for the long whole notes and lie back and think of England. For Pianissimo, he tells us of his beloved who breathes so quietly at night you can't hear her. During the old hymns, we picture fireworks, but fireworks without the grand finale. As for the solo vibrato, he reminds me, with his left hand, of poplars in the still air. I think of Julie Andrews thinking of chocolate mousse, Paul Simon contemplating the smooth grind of earth on its axis, Billie Holiday awash in returned letters. Perhaps those high Baroque tenors ponder frying on a spit, and overblown sopranos memorize the garish, decrepit tulip the day before the petals drop. For intonation, there's the Cheshire Cat, how it feels itself folded into harmony with the air just before evaporating. For elegant polish, he told us the story of singing Gloria up at Limerence Lake at sunrise on the longest day of the year. Do not think of the dull thud of the cracked plate placed on the table. Avoid, he tells us, any glance to the flowers on the altar, the unfortunate dissonance of the daisy's stale smell. And for the amen, think of cinching the last loop in signing a marriage certificate. Think of the unity implied on the tombstone that reads, children, come look, the mountain is out. Thanks, program, and I'm happy to introduce Ryan Dunn, who's going to be reading today. Ryan is 18, and he's a senior at O'Day. And um, he has participated in the Words at Risk program at Bumbershoot, and also the Scribes Project, which is a two-week writing course at Richard Hugo House, and he's hoping to go to Reed College. Um, if it's all right with you today, he's going to be reading three poems. I think there's only two in your packet, but if it's okay with you, he's going to be reading three because one of them is very short. So I'm pleased to introduce Ryan Dunn. All right. The first one is called Lost, Macag Lost Packages Marked Handle of Care. Closest to heart and mouth, let leave take your place as my mistress. 
and pride in sacred judgments, replaceable not for friends' fingertips, secure its genuine. When astray, my Cupid, but straight goes the bow, and your ricochet keeps truth, for I as long as you, and parting would lend locks and petals. Sentiment security is in touch, and prolongation of injury is contained without, without remembrance towards infinite and the light at the end. There is fortitude tunneling in the reasoning of a heart and tossing refuse to the mind, cornering injustice for pallid reverie by eye and heart. Wench will only sustain when finalism and decision come to incredible gravity and do what particle physics cannot, predict the formation of the end of loneliness. This one is called Feeling Citric. Orange bankruptcy, spoiling plans into creation of sweet juices and kisses, citrus burning, lips and veins, eyes and soul. This is called Educating Arrogance. Impudent students, inside circles of better than and outside of letting be, the incorrigible determination of above. Narcotics feeding the identity of and ego inside the generally pleasurable and calm. Argumentative beginnings only destroy possibility as pregnancy of pallets of luscious courses course past and set simply on the table of others. The lost tonation which could have adjusted rigorous justification bestowed upon the waiting and ready is paused, maybe for yet another day. Eventually this, the parched lips will forget the sandpaper, will forget the alcoholic dehydrator of intent, and bring forth the sweet juices, the liquid water, and pour almost libelously into a thirsting head. The discussion of something seemingly derivable, but intriguing, of the unknown, but seen before, the possible been dreamt of. It keeps out the jogging mind, speeding off to other places as quick as the almost obvious takes root in gluttonous feet. While the knowledge stores itself, it is still unobserved as the holidays, like, one, like ones we call religious, once sacred and advising, now tasteless, arousing the fears of the passionate and the love of common folk. Open-ended and guarded, the mind of the apprentice of, uh, the apprentice of self-believing interests, boring and in-between, as either not challenged or idiocy. Thank you. Thanks. I'm pleased to introduce um, Nathaniel Luke Pinzon, who writes under the name of Nathaniel Seven. He's 22 years old and a resident of the U District. He has worked quite extensively with the Zine Project, which is a program in the University District that does um, work training and job skills, as well as producing a magazine called Neurotic Filth, <laughs> which is um, actually for sale for $2. Nathaniel has one copy left. I'd be willing to sell mine and get another one later. Um, <laughs> He says he is working now in an embarrassing retail job part-time and spends a lot of other the rest of his time writing and selling the magazine. He um, finds poetry boring and likes to make his own poetry three-dimensional. Nathaniel said he likes to be introduced as a force of nature, so I am pleased to introduce as a force of nature Nathaniel Seven. Hello, thank you for coming. Um, I guess I'll just start. This is, don't mind me, I might bust up laughing when I'm reading this, because, you know, I'm put, on, I'm put on the spot, you know? I can feel, feel you all. I can feel the hum, hum of your vibe. I can hear the vibrations of your psych, and because I am open to you, I can feel all of your seepage. And it affects the way that I feel, and the way that I touch, and the way that I think. You're kind of like me. You burn bright and you burn inside out. Your reaction can be my anchor, just like they could be my wings. I can feel, feel your heart, and I know you can feel me because you've got empathy. You can feel, feel the way that I touch. You can feel, feel the way that I feel, feel, and the way that I think because you're kind of like me. That's my first piece. <laughs> um, the second piece is kind of weird to describe. Uh, I guess when you're homeless, it's kind of a weird occupation and a weird state of mind. And a lot of people, um, I guess, who are homeless, you can't help but being a little bit of a leech. And, uh, and that's be everything, not just money and time, but also love and attention and a lot of other things. And um, 
sometimes you don't even know it, but you're kind of a little bit too using or a little bit too leeching. And um, I kind of wrote this about somebody who I was hanging out with who I just thought was just sucking everything out of me. And this was kind of a poem, I guess, like from his perspective, as if he was mocking me, pretending that he's an evil agent who uh, was just there to drive me insane. So this next piece is called User Friendly. I'm a hard pill to swallow. I know I'm pretty shallow. My words will strike you as hollow, and you'll go through withdrawals if I leave you. Poison companionship, symbiotic relationship. I'm like a callous prescription, and I'm like a meth addiction. You won't know why you're with me, yet you continue to kiss me. That's it. <laughs> in poetry from Iowa State University. She's a teacher by profession and her poems have appeared in Seattle Review and Connecticut River Review, among others. Um, she has two book-length manuscripts that she's shopping around and had a chat book called Stillwater, oh no, called Rune of Salt Air, published by Stillwater's Press. Hi, um, I wrote these particular poems. I'm going to read two today while I was living in Nepal for a year and I hope you'll join me on a journey to the Annapurna Range. At the foot of Annapurna, rhododendrons cluster vibrant chords of music, reds in unreachable places. A ridge below clouds, floating world, rocks, air, and moss. In such silence, mountains and snow, I forget how to speak, and my eyes are the only sense I am allowed. My eyes cast out, return, I try to ascend, and receive. Let the sky polish my sight as it meets rocks, snow, as it descends from infinite space. The wisdom of the goddess touches down here, leaving mountain and me. Hold this silence as a gift. Admit heaven. Admit the possibilities of joy. How long since my eyes transcended earth and the limits of a body five foot three inches? How long since my soul rebounded to the sky? No limits. Annapurna better than imagination. Eyes opening each time below, then following each unbelievable ridge until sky means sky. The pathway beyond faith, the sudden earthbound inhalation, bliss, then breath. The second poem takes place um, in Deir Raleigh during a trek. Silences in Deo Raleigh. A father dozes against a stone wall. A goat and a child are butting heads. One leaps in the air and wiggles. One crouches down for a laugh, then a jump. The father sleeps in the sun all afternoon. Bony water buffaloes stare at us mournfully, as if waiting for a scratch or a finder of fleas. Beyond the ridges, we watch the clouds flow in their own currents, layer above layer, glimpses of sky, blue, gray. If the trees were still here on these Nepal hillsides, they would be rustling, quivering like tambourines. But as it is, silence meshes with the wind, monosyllabic runes, and the mountains echo nothing in their cloud cover, remote, austere. If there were birds here at 12,000 feet, the cascade of sound might linger and warm the dirt yard, the mud building, the slate roof held on by stones, waiting this first storm for an honest reckoning. If silence had color, it would be white, like a flock of wings, or like this snow falling on us now. Soon the mountains will be left alone, islands abandoned, the arteries of the colors of the trekkers and porters stopped in their tracks, waiting. Now the father awakes, the snows falling on him, the constant clatter of his wife with pans and water, with kerosene for the fire, with her own thoughts heavier than silence. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to read today. Uh, we'll begin with Wordsworth, which is curated by Tina Kelly. And Tina, would you introduce our poet today? Great. Thanks, Nick. It's a real privilege today to introduce Francis McHugh, who is the executive director of Richard Hugo House, a writing center on Capitol Hill. Francis is a poet, critic, and educational reformer. She has a book out called The Stenographer's Breakfast, which was published by Beacon Press in 1992. 
Um, she received a Klingenstein Fellowship at Columbia University for researching school reform, and um, she was a dean and writer in residence for five years at the Bush School. It's a real privilege to introduce Frances McHugh today. Hi, thanks so much for having me. I'm going to read you two poems, and they're inspired a little bit. Um, they're older poems, but we're having a shelter conference at Hugo House in the fall, and I've been thinking a lot about housing and shelter. And this one is from a, a rundown house I used to live in, and it's called What's Dangerous About Plumbing? For weeks, that water line held gravity's wings and refused to leave the ceiling for the floor. Above, I walked the edges of my rooms. What would it take to torque the thing? One loose doorbell, some plants twitch, all dangers smooth as pins. Imagine the silt once the flood soaked in. The wires hanging ready urge the pipe to drop. They'll need only one wet spark. I could have fixed it then, the girl who loosened everything, saw pipes and fiddled with the bolts. Nothing scared me when I crawled under sinks, climbed ladders, I'd hitch the pipe up and go heavy through the house. The problem here, I think, is knowing how the pipe will blow ahead of time. Any minute now, I'm sure, there's no time to get the tools. Uneven currents crackle through the walls as the pipe meanders under floorboards, drips. Comes the moment when I wish it would flip its shackles, give the house a shudder, let me fire up the pumps and splash by splash, go headlong, then recover. And this, uh, the second poem I'm gonna read is, um, it's called Doctor, Doctor, and it's a little sonnet uh, about insomnia personified as a doctor. When sleep is sultry, ham hock sweat to nose and mouth, the surgeon of insomnia sets the bones, work endowed by human rumblings, folding in armless and enormous. He's never lost a patient, even with pills. Without a white coat, but sporting wingtips dusty as cats, the surgeon jolts ahead, keeping the patient wide-eyed. Raid on bedclothes, he stirs this woman awake. Turn up the heat, chug the wind. But who keeps the surgeon up, alert and sinewy? Untimely precision, a graveyard shift, dismantling sleep with such clear slices. Wake, wake, wake up. This is a house call. We're losing time. Thank you.